So welcome everybody um, to the 2023 billing and revenue cycle survey discussion and, and webinar presentation. I am uh, Chris Ryan um, with Harbor. I lead our law firm go to market initiatives, um, inclusive of our client engagement and account teams. Hey everyone, I'm Jamie Wilchin. I'm a director with Harbor in our strategy and transformation practice and help lead our law firm um, optimization group. And we focus more broadly on business support services transformation, including looking at the revenue cycle that we're here to talk about today. Christine Indiano, I'm a senior manager within that group. Um, I primarily focus on revenue cycle assessments, um, current state assessments, as well as the transformation and improvement implementation work in this space specifically. And I'm Henry Rosenstein. I'm a consultant in the strategy and transformation group with Jamie and Christine, uh, also working on law firm optimization work. And I also serve as the project manager for the billing and revenue cycle survey. So we'll be your guides and sources of info for today. But as you can imagine, a lot of help behind the scenes by our marketing team, by um, you know additional analysts that, that help gather you know the data and work with Henry and Christine. Um, we do a lot of this work, um, you know, with with law firms in the market um, around helping assess and optimize, um, you know, their billing and revenue cycle, you know, functions. So um, look forward to to any of your perspectives and, and questions today. So, um, so real quick PSA: We are Harbor. It's hard for me to say that without the farmers insurance, you know, music. Um, but we are deep in legal, um, as you can see. Um, I'll give a, a, a quick update on how we've integrated with a number of other businesses, but we focus primarily on the, the global 200 law firms and um, Fortune 500 law departments. We do some um, additional, you know, work with, um, you know, kind of some industry sectors outside of, of that. So, you know, other corporations and government um, in certain areas. We're, we're just shy of about 700 people now of, of consultants, technologists, subject matter experts, um, again, focused on the legal industry. And this is just a little makeup of our um, practice groups that, that uh, you know, serve, you know, our law department and law firm clients. Um, that kind of last comment is just around our commitment to this, to this uh, industry and um, thought leadership and, you know, surveys and trends and insights that we like to gather, um, you know, as evident from, you know, this, this survey today that's been about seven years running. So 35 uh, participants um, in this year's survey, it's pretty similar to the last several years, you know, kind of in that 30 to 40 range um, to give you a sense of the profile and the type of firms. Um, so a little over, you know, a thousand people and a little, you know, about a billion and a half in revenue on average. So you can see that the majority of the firms are in that AMLAW 50, kind of global 50 um, size, size firms. But um, a number of kind of massive firms, a number of firms that are a little bit smaller than that. And so the composition by attorney count as well. Um, all law firms are going through very similar challenges and, and have opportunities to improve their revenue cycle. So, um, you know, whether a firm, you know, has a specific, you know, focus in, in practice area or whether they're, you know, diverse firm and global, they're all kind of going through similar, um, you know, issues and, and opportunities. So the next slide just, so, you know, is going to ask the question, um, so who's joining today? So we've got CFOs, presumably COOs, directors of kind of billing and revenue management, finance, accounting, other. Okay, looks like we've kind of landed on numbers pretty close. So before we jump into the details of the 2023 survey findings, we wanted to briefly kind of recap what the survey has covered, as well as some higher level trends we're seeing in the market to set the stage for today's conversation. So the framework you see on this page here is the client matter life cycle framework that we've, we've developed and refined um, over the years uh, with, with law firm leaders to represent kind of the end to end process of bringing clients in the door, um, going through intake, getting bills out, collections, and subsequently all those different operational touch points that make up the revenue cycle and how you're interacting with your clients. And this framework really has been the foundation for how we developed the survey questions um, to make sure we're covering comprehensively from an enabling people, process, policy, technology perspective to understand what firms are doing across those different dimensions um, across that client life cycle that's ultimately impacting um, revenue generation and collections. So I want to use this to set the stage. And then on this next page here, 
um, wanted to bring to bear some macro market trends that are based on, um, of course, what we're hearing in our survey, but also anecdotally, what we're hearing in the market as we speak with law firms and what we're seeing other industry publications and research that groups um, produce when we talk about this space. So I'll call out a few high-level trends here, and then, as I mentioned, we'll dive into the details of the survey. Um, first and foremost, in terms of an increased ROI and revenue realization being driven significantly by policy changes and enforcement mechanisms to help reduce leakages. So we're starting to see firms um, shore up things, particularly around time entry being more assertive with how they're approaching that so that we're reducing different leakages to the point that that can cause throughout the revenue cycle. Changes in AI and tech, uh, you probably couldn't go through a trends briefing in, in the last six months without hearing something about AI, um, but it certainly, as we talk about technology in this space, we're seeing vendors start to explore and introduce um, different project products that are incorporating elements of predictive analytics in AI. Uh, we think over the next year in particular, there's gonna be a lot of changes on this front. So it's an ever evolving marketplace, but have started to see um, in terms of time entry prediction, uh, monitoring of outside council guidelines, some different applications being used there that we expect to continue to mature over the next year plus as the, the technology advances. We're also seeing when we think about that, the life cycle we just looked at, uh, firms taking a more holistic approach to resourcing and roles in this space. So not just thinking about um, the individual kind of AP or AR function and the different subsects of what makes up the revenue cycle, but having individuals in chief and director's positions who have a pulse across these different dimensions so that they're creating that streamlined experience and are able to provide kind of that larger point of view on where there are opportunities to improve performance across the revenue cycle. Future state planning, so certainly on the similar front, thinking about whether it's people, process, or tech, um, prioritizing what this next generation of roadmaps looks like for finance functions in terms of how they're, they're identifying different opportunities to improve performance. And then all this is happening in the backdrop of, kind of broader economic realities. So we've seen over, you know, in 2022 and now in 2023, slight decreases in demand for big law or holding studies. So there are external pressures that are creating um, you know, a reality to more urgently address and improve processes and collection efforts from the, the finance aspect. So with that, I wanted to tee us up for the heart of our discussion today, which is going through um, the results of the, the survey. We've broken this into three sections that we'll walk through that really focus on the key takeaways. So we'll start um, first and foremost with process improvements and the use of technology, what firms are doing in this space to, to think about this differently and to drive different automations and efficiencies. We'll then jump into new and, and evolving roles. Um, so as I mentioned on that holistic resourcing, we'll give you a sense of the different types of changes we're seeing and how uh, departments are structuring and resourcing different elements of this. And then the final piece will end on updated and enforced policies. So what changes we're seeing to help um, reduce leakages and reduce the uh, overall kind of success and, and performance of the functions that play here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christine. She's going to walk us through some of the process and improvement and use of technology findings. Thanks, Jimmy. So jumping in <clears throat> to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about some impactful areas for to focus for process improvement um, with that tech. Um, so we've highlighted five areas here, um, you know, over the course of the life of a matter um, where we're seeing those develop. So WIP reporting and tracking against budgets, billing analytics, um, which it, looking at the data does look like it includes a little bit of time entry um, predictive and analytics as well. Um, electronic performa and pre-bills e-billing technology, as well as um, write down approvals and write off approvals. Um, and the percentages here you're seeing are today, how many firms um, surveyed have tools in place to support um, you know, those processes. 
Um, and each of these processes and uh, tech can have a really big impact on the bottom line, as well as client and attorney satisfaction. So we've called out some of those benefits in bold on the slide as well. Just thinking about one of these and, and really diving in, um, electronic pre-bills and pro forma tools has been, you know, such a huge shift for the market um, over the last few years. Almost 70% of firms have tools in place today when it's talking about reviewing and editing those. And almost 50% of the firms we surveyed have that covering the majority of their review and editing process, which is a really big leap from where we've done before. I think last year, it's only about a third of firms had that as the majority of their process. So really great gaining incremental um, adoption there um, with these tools. Um, this was a really big shift from even five years ago where I think we had in our 2017 survey, only 20% of firms using an electronic pre-bill or pro forma tool. So now up to 70. So pretty big you know, shift in the market. It's enabling bills to get out faster. It's improving collaboration and coordination among the reviewers, um, the attorneys, as well as the, you know, the team themselves, the billing team, and being able to track and, and manage where those are to get them out faster and, and move things along. I think throughout all of these items, though, there are, you know, examples where I can think of and the team can think of where we've seen the firms perhaps take a misstep or a common come an issue that's raised even after implementation. And that's sometimes, you know, thinking a little bit too, um, you know, not holistically enough, I guess. And so perhaps implementing in, in too much of a vacuum. Um, so where firms are maybe planning or not planning and not adjusting the processes along with that tech or not creating new roles to support that adoption. Um, so for, again, electronic pro forma to go back to that, you know, pre-built tool, an example would mean shifting roles to enable um, someone to maybe do a pre-review of that bill before an attorney sees it. Maybe it's ensuring that your legal support teams can input the edits for attorneys who don't like the tool. Um, so really having some, some pieces in place for um, the success of, of that process and the success of the tool and really ensuring there's a holistic review when going about this implementation. Another example is, you know, considering policies as you're looking at your tech. Um, for instance, will your write down approvals be integrated into your pro forma and pre bill tool? Um, it's something to really think about um, and, and um, consider. And so you'll see this kind of theme of coordination and, and holistic um, review, as Jimmy had said throughout, throughout the presentation. So jumping into outside counsel guidelines. So this is a hot, hot area of focus. Um, it's been this way, I think, for each of the years that we've asked priority levels for firms. So this year, about 65% of firms said that outside counsel guideline improvement is, is a top priority um, only after billing process improvement. So it makes sense given we're seeing such a huge significant focus of law departments focus on enforcing their own outside counsel guidelines. So getting a handle on it for firms is really, really key. It was interesting to see only 37% of firms, so less than 40% have an outside counsel guideline tool in place to help the automation of reviewing, summarizing, and distributing, distrib distributing that you know key items from those um, from those fields. Um, I mean, sixty percent of firms you can see that on the right hand side have stated that they have a defined process. But what we're seeing as we're working with firms is that process might be defined, but it might not be well known. Perhaps there could be some gaps in that process. I think there's a really good opportunity to maybe um, focus on that automation and really closing the gaps. For instance, um, even in our survey, I noticed a few different areas where we're seeing potential overlap in the review of data. So we've listed just three items here um, or di three different pieces of the process where it might be very similar data being reviewed by similar folks or even the same folks um, throughout the 
you know, one billing cycle. For instance, if you're looking at outside council guideline data at the very beginning of the matter, um, you could be looking at it again in a pre-review of pro formas. About 50% of firms have someone looking at the pre-bills and the pro formas um, to ensure compliance with outside council guidelines. But then also 77% of firms have a final review of invoices by someone um, who knows the client and the outside council guidelines. So it, there seems to be a little bit of overlap there um, that, that needs to kind of be ensured that there's a, a reduction in that disjointedness. Christine, would you would you relate some of the previous slide, you know, the write down percentage is, is, is gone down, you know, noteworthy to, to mention that. Um, obviously the lot at play, but do you think some of the strides that have been made, obviously on, on some of the tools and investments and adoption that firms have made, you know, whether it's electronic pro forma or around outside council guideline capture and workflow and putting resource behind it. I mean, any any kind of thoughts or correlation on, on that, you know, to improve the the write downs to drive that down? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure how much there is a correlation between the write down perspective with that outside council guidelines. It could certainly be that. It could certainly be the next slide where we just talk about data quality in general um, and improving, you know, ensuring that someone is is making sure the right information from the engagement letters or you know, updates and rates are being checked and kind of confirmed um, along with that compliance. So I think it could be a little bit of everything. It could also just be firms are getting a little bit better about write down approvals and tracking and, and making sure that there's some avoidable maybe analysis that's being done and circling back with the legal ops teams and, and the attorneys themselves to ensure that, you know, again, avoidable situations are, are perhaps noted. So for the next time they have a matter like that, it can be kind of in the back of everyone's minds. So I think it's a little bit of everything. So talking about, you know, improving the data quality um, at the beginning of the, the matter. I mean, I think this is so key and we're seeing a lot of firms really focus on this, um, mostly because, um, you know, it can have a really big impact. So, you know, 63% of firms have someone um, a combination of intake or legal support or pricing, take a look at the data and the accuracy at the very beginning of a matter. We also have, you know, 66% um, percent of firms have someone, you know, looking for the hygiene of the matters in AFAs. And then another set of firms who are also have something in the time entry space, looking at, you know, automating um, features that will really identify non-compliant time, making sure that firms and those end users and timekeepers are aware of, of the rules um, and what to do. So I think there's also kind of this important shift to look at everything, not only the outside council guidelines, but all the holistic pieces of the clients and matters um, throughout the matter life cycle and ensure that there's some accuracy there. I think one concern that I noted when I see 63% of firms have a combination of intake pricing and legal support um, about 20% of firms said it's billing and e-billing who's doing it. So that combination is a little concerning. Um, we've seen that at firms where we work, um, where it's an expected role that someone is taking a look at it, but maybe because it's not centralized enough, there's that opportunity for lack of accountability. Um, sometimes just it's falling to the to the back of someone's plate. So I think there's a really interesting um, opportunity there to further centralize and ensure that that, number one, data quality um, or compliance is even happening. And number two, it's it's happening with the most, um, you know, the best person to do it, really, who is not being overpaid, but also has that really key knowledge of client expectations, matter expectations, even the practice and the way that that's going to work. So making sure that um, it's the right people doing it. And then when we're talking about, you know, process improvement, um, possible data issues, almost always um, when we're working with firms, we're hearing about rates and timekeepers being a huge issue. Um, this is definitely something that's evident with e-billing. Um, I think most e-billing folks would say that's probably their number one rejection reason. 
So it was interesting to take a look at some of the data points at the beginning of the life cycle and see that most firms, about 51% have software to assist with pricing. About 40% of firms um, are using something for the annual um, rate review and the setting process. And then about 31% of firms have some sort of software that is using a workflow with the rates. So I think there's an opportunity here. You know, we're seeing these numbers. It's it's gaining incrementally, but I think there's an opportunity here to further improve that workflow and ensure that you're taking it a step further. Once you've got the rates, that's great that it's been decided. It's great that that's been approved from the attorneys, hopefully approved on the clients. I know that's another process, but in the end, it has to get into the finance system and through the e-billing system. So really, I think there's an opportunity to shore up the entire revenue cycle process as it comes through with this data and ensure that that's, that's correct. So coming through into resourcing, there's gonna be a few different areas that we're gonna to touch on. I believe we have a poll first to, to uh, conduct. Wanted to get the group's sense uh, what your firm's top revenue cycle resourcing challenges are. Interesting. That attorney time and frustration, I mean, obviously you're getting, you know, complaints or emails or, or, or people are, you know, writing, or you've got, you know, a centralized place to capture that, but it is something that we continuously advocate for is just to try to monitor or, or, um, quantify, you know, attorneys involvement in the revenue cycle. And so we can be able to identify some of the opportunity costs, you know, related to that, you know, which hopefully if we can minimize will lead to less frustration, but yeah, no question. Mm. Late last year, we saw talent management, retention, recruiting being much higher as well, which was, yeah. you know, a theme across the market, but uh, happy to see some of that appears to be cooling off a bit. Cool. I think we've kind of landed on this. Okay. So we'll touch on a couple different areas of, of resourcing. So the first will be kind of emerging roles and, and new, you know, viewpoints. The next slide, I'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit about the billing and e-billing teams specifically, and then, you know, other support. So when we're talking about emerging roles and, and the shift here in the, in the market, obviously leadership within, you know, the revenue cycle is really interesting. Um, the emergence of the director of revenue um, at 40% of firms have that leadership um, role when we were talking maybe what, three or four years ago, Chris, you know, that role was just kind of just being talked about, needing someone to be able to look at this a little bit more holistically, have that, you know, ownership over every piece of the revenue cycle, or at least that ability to include it in, um, include it in their oversight. So it was interesting to see this climb and climb each year um, towards that holistic overview of that, that revenue director. Um, we're also seeing, these are just some examples that we've pulled from, from recent work with clients where we're seeing new roles emerge within the revenue cycle in different areas, whether it be intake, billing, um, sometimes collections even. And it's kind of emerging a little bit with the legal ops side and the LPM side and really filling in gaps where we're seeing um, maybe it's not necessarily a bill processor who's owning it, it's not necessarily a paralegal. It's someone in between that. So we're noticing, for instance, that client, um, financial client specialist or practice specific specialist, it's someone who can really step in and, and take on more of the um, ad hoc work that attorneys are dealing with. And that's kind of to the last poll question. You know, how do we help attorneys give them a point person who can really go and coordinate everything from appeals to bills to, um, you know, RFPs and pricing. So we're seeing, you know, a lot of different roles emerge. Um, it's been really interesting to watch and hear all the different language and and um, titles. But that's been a really interesting thing we're we're keeping a pulse on. So billing and e-billing staff, obviously, a, a huge, you know, core aspect of the revenue cycle. Um, you know, similar to years past, we are seeing a pretty big shift towards specialization. Um, and that's been helping efficiencies. It's been helping deliver, you know, more accurate bills. Um, so we saw a big 20% um, increase from last year in client assignments when it comes into billing. 
Um, so obviously with client expectations, complexity and the rules, that's been really, really necessary. Um, so some firms are really identifying, is it a portion of our clients? Is it just really the biggest revenue? Is it, um, is it you know, other type of key clients that we need to give the support? Is it more of a practice group focus? Um, so we're seeing practice specific assignments pop up as well. Um, so it's been kind of an interesting shift in optimizing the billing resources and ensuring that they really have that specialization and build a morale. Um, I think that the morale among the team can kind of increase and feel a little bit closer as they have that cross collaboration um, and that backup um, with kind of these teams that are being created. Similar, we're also seeing that on the e-billing side. Um, I've only included some of the top tasks where the e-billing dedicated team would be focused. So I think about 65% of firms have an e-billing focused team. Um, primarily, that's really been specialized with the admin setups, inputting rates, timekeepers, that, that research. So whereas years past, we've had maybe 15 tasks um, that are e-billing related and we've asked firms to rank. Um, we're really seeing a shift and centralization on focus of those team members to very specific e-billing um, tasks. So that was also kind of an interesting movement this year. And then finally, there's another piece of, of resourcing, which is the supporting resources. How are firms using legal support staff and um, even outsourcing? So we know that the majority of firms are still using the legal support staff that number has been pretty consistent, maybe even a little bit lower than years past. Um, but we know that there's a very specific place where they're increasing um, those roles. So I think we have about 70% of firms who are using secretaries or legal support staff in inputting edits for pro formas and pre-bills into systems. So again, that's coming back into where we talked about looking at the process, looking at your roles when you're implementing tools this is an example of increasing the focus and the support so attorneys feel comfortable using those tools. Or if they don't, at least you can use it for your firm and it kind of implement that adoption rate um, with another resource. We're also seeing their increase um, of use and it's I think it's gonna be close to 90% once this has increased, but most firms are using them for a review of narratives um, prior to attorney review. So again, trying to reduce that attorney frustration, trying to add additional support. Um, so it was interesting to see, you know, the way that that those resources are being used. And then there was a pretty big shift this year um, from last year um, on resourcing. So the resourcing, the two, 2022 data is in orange. So you can kind of see, we saw an increase um, from outsourcing both fully outsourced, which is that dark blue navy color, versus partially outsourced, which is that light blue. And we saw an increase kind of almost across the board, um, especially in the collections area and um, in the e-billing area. So, you know, firms are not opposed to looking at um, the right way to use resources, if that means outside the firm. And now that we've talked about the processes and, and the resourcing, kind of the final component now that we've set that up is then the policies, which Henry will cover. Thank you, Christine. So as mentioned, uh, having the processes and technology in place can uh, help with driving impactful policy enforcement. So today we're going to be mostly looking at uh, time entry and performa uh, review policies as these can uh, pretty directly impact the speed of getting bills out the door and in turn invoices paid quicker. But before we jump into that, uh, one more poll, Evie. Okay, so this particular poll, we're looking for what are the biggest barriers to change encountered when trying to implement policies? Yeah, I think everybody is okay, so. <laughs> record, you know, recognizing this is a, a massive change effort. Behavioral, getting people the tools and additional skills, and that takes time, that takes change, that takes alignment. Okay. Great. So looking at time entry, uh, we've seen the majority of firms encourage a daily time entry policy, um, but actually enforce a policy of getting that time in in about the two to three days to weekly range. 
Uh, this has been pretty interesting to see just kind of as a development over the past couple of years, uh, that two to three day option. So last year when we actually conducted this survey, we didn't even ask if two or three days was an encouraged or uh, enforced deadline. And so many firms were just filling up that other option and saying two to three days, 48 hours, midweek, et cetera, et cetera, that this year we included it. And now we're seeing about a third of firms um, enforcing that as a policy. So um, pretty big disparity in terms of getting that daily time in versus actually enforcing it daily, but a lot of encouragement there to help timekeepers hit that midweek deadline. Uh, additionally, we've seen a lot of different tactics used to help um, enforce getting that time in. Typically, the tactics that we see uh, to be most useful are financial tactics. Uh, an example of that could be withholding a draw for a partner, uh, impacting an associate's or non-partner's bonus, um, things of that nature. But um, really, really interesting data here that we're excited to keep an eye on in the coming years. And I think, Henry, we saw a pretty big shift you know, I think just generally in the last, you know, five years between, you know, now close to 80% of firms are are really in, encouraging daily. And I think maybe back 2016, 2017, we, we were talking about it in our survey. Not many firms, I think it was technically written down, but not many firms were holding that realistic. I think generally it was more of a bi-monthly, so every two weeks or a monthly deadline. So it's really interesting to see over the last few years, this this big push to be less than weekly or at least weekly in that contemporaneous focus. And then looking at pre-bill and performa policies, uh, as Chris said before, we see a lot of attorney time in the revenue cycle process. Um, from some of our past assessment and uh, transformation work over the past year, we've seen about five to six hours spent uh, monthly by attorney looking at performas and pre-bills for narratives, write-downs, um, things of that nature. So really drives home the importance of having those processes um, and tech in place to help limit that attorney time spent so that they can spend their time billing. Um, and then looking at some of the policies uh, in place for performer returns, this has been a pretty big switch over the past six years. We've seen an increase of eight firms to 31 firms that have some sort of mid-month deadline, typically around the 15th. Um, tactics for enforcing this deadline Again, it's normally the financial um, targets that, that are most effective, but we've also seen notifications to firm management, lists of late timekeepers that are behind on pro formas as well. And I think that five to six hours is, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it certainly depends on the attorney, right? I think at each firm we've seen over 10 hours spent. It depends on the practice group a little bit as well. Um, it depends on also, I think, all of the supporting pieces. So do they have the additional resources to help them, you know, spend less time? Do they have the right tools? Is the data, you know, just a better quality to start with? Um, so I think there's a lot of pieces that we've covered so far that really will impact or drive down what that average is for firms. And once you reduce that, that average time spent, I think that gives you the opportunity to then move into you know, addressing the change management aspect of a deadline. <laughs> so you can say we've done A, B, C, D to really make this successful and, and be able to do this deadline, which will then kind of drive us towards better client satisfaction and, and feeling better about getting their bills out, um, more accurate bills out. So I think it's all very closely, um, as you said, intertwined and connected. So in summary, um, just three holistic areas to look at being processes and tech, resource management and policies. Um, not necessarily a sequential way in terms of tackling these, they're all pretty interrelated. As an example, with a lot of the performance systems now, you can easily put your policies directly in the system to route write downs to proper approvers. Um, with timekeeping, you can have warnings and blocking so that non-compliant narratives are captured automatically. So. Lots of integration for these three three areas, but with processes in tech, um, a lot of impact directly into the accuracy and billing and improved compliance. Like I said before, with uh, the timekeeping, making sure that the narratives are correct, um, getting getting bills out the door a little bit quicker there. Uh, with resource management, having effective administrative support to help limit that five to six hours that attorneys are spending within the revenue cycle. And then with policies, um, 
having policies that get, make sure that time is entered um, by the correct deadline, that attorneys are um, returning performers to billers to help get them out the door and help improve that overall revenue cycle collection timing. So just as a, a summary of our next steps, so for the 35 firms that participated, uh, we're in the process of finalizing the custom benchmarking reports uh, that will be sent out to you. So those will um, cover in a lot more detail everything that was included in the survey this year. Um, and we'll be highlighting your answers within that data so you can pretty clearly and easily see uh, how your answer is compared to the market. So that I know some questions are coming in through Q and A. Christine, so the first question, you know, Jamie Austin um, or Henry, uh, with regards to collections, there seems to be a big increase in outsourcing. I would think that is a sensitive area. Is the outsourcing only for statement sending? Um, I guess, it, and please add more, you know, color here. I mean, it's it's relative in terms of the the big increase, you know, it, it's still a pretty small portion, um, relatively speaking of firms, but it is, you know, just percentage wise, um, you know, we're seeing that increase. I think we're hearing and, and seeing in the data that clients are sort of pushing off or pushing out payment um, a little bit too. I think firms are wanting to, and, and maybe a little bit more comfortable in exploring using third-party resources for partial or for all of their outsourcing or their collections needs. Um, you know, so that may include, you know, kind of statement sending. Christine, do you want to add a little more context yeah. and color there? Yeah, I think when speaking to firms, I think actually collections might be the area where they feel most comfortable. Um, yeah. And be it's because they can really, and I obviously some firms answered it was their entire collections, um, but a lot of firms said it was just partial. And usually when they're looking at partially outsourcing, they're looking at what is the oldest AR that we have? What is something low risk that, you know, we can just have someone working on? And usually when firms are working with those outsource providers, it's a it's a very close connection where you've got someone within the firm who's owning that relationship and you've got very tight, you know, examples of what your your emails are looking like and what the phone calls are looking like. So I think it's a pretty low risk area with a lot of control from the firm side um, on having that additional work being done by someone. And the increase, the question of, is the increase in outsourcing, so similar, similar vein, attributable to the continual shift to more remote work? Mm -hmm. um, so welcome my colleagues, additional input, but but yeah, I think I think that's some of it. I mean, I think firms have taken advantage of the ability to um, those that have you know a little bit more flexible policies. I know that that people are trying to get firms are trying to get you know people in the office more, particularly you know partners and attorneys for mentoring and, and a variety of reasons, but also with business services staff and it's sort of different strokes for different folks. But um, yeah, that is that has kind of opened the door to exploring more third party outsourcings that are that are outfits that are well vetted, um, that have experience that they're comfortable with that align with 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 the firm's needs and some of the you know technology I think we always would advocate, you know, getting your process um, right getting sort of your policies and, and your tech in place getting that right first before um, outsourcing because it should be sort of an augmentation or extension of your team and ideally um, as or more effective and ideally um, more cost effective too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, it was interesting. I think we saw a pretty good shift of firms and we're talking about kind of like the guidelines of setting guidelines on working for the revenue cycle staff um, coming into the office. And I think it was close to 80% of firms had answered that they had some sort of guideline in place. Now, what the guideline said, the majority, the vast majority, I think it was almost everyone said it was a combination of remote, hybrid, in-person, or just hybrid. Um, so I think there's a lot of flexibility, it looks like in this year's survey, that, that firms answered, providing that team, the billing and e-billing team, the other revenue cycle teams um, in the back office area to be able to work from um, home. And so I think that's an interesting um, perspective that it could have a, a, a fact or be, be advocating for that. And then I guess one other kind of note on that vein is not necessarily related to outsourcing, but 
um, re regarding retainment um, and recruiting, we had about 65% of firms who adjusted compensation um, for their own um, team members um, to increase retention and improve recruiting. So also another kind of element when you're looking at outsourcing is obviously the cost perspective. Um, and about 66% of firms are looked at this last year at, at that change in compensation. So still kind of a, an important topic to consider. Are you seeing, another question, are you seeing a rise in clients scrutinizing the language used by outside firms to describe the services they render on a billing statement? Jamie, Christine. I don't see if, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's gotten more significant as of late, but in terms of like outside council guidelines, scrutiny of uh, narratives, um, block billing, how time is itemized, that is certainly, you know, every time we talk to larger corporations, something that's a, a high priority and frustration piece there. I do also think there's technology advancements on both sides that are making that a little easier for in-house teams to pick some of that up in an automated fashion versus manual. So, you know, therefore maybe just catching more than they had in, in the past. Christine, anything else, you know, from your perspective? Um, no, I think that's, that's good perspective, um, given your work on the law department side. Um, I mean, certainly from the law firm side, and and all the clients, I think on on their behalf, I think we're all seeing some pressure related to to that. And it kind of depends a little bit on the practice group, I would say, because we can work with some practice groups where, you know, they they'll say our clients don't really, they don't really care, or they might say in their outside counsel guidelines they care, but we can get it through anyways. So there still is, from my perspective and perception, you can tell me I'm incorrect, Jamie, that there might be a disconnect in the legal ops teams of um, of that in-house versus what's actually being, um, you know, coordinated on the e-billing tool. And so what can they actually get through versus what's actually being watched? And so there seems to be a little bit of sometimes disconnect on that side. Well, and we typically, you know, ask in our law department survey, which has, you know, been going for about 16, 17 years, certainly over the last several we, you know, when we ask around outside counsel selection and their criteria and how they prioritize or rank, you know, inevitably, you know, the the experience that they have with their outside counsel related to even bills, you know, the this the speed, the time, you know, timeliness, the accuracy, you know, that goes into um, you know some of the selection criteria, and maybe it's a little bit you know further down the list, but it's been kind of steadily you know increasing in something that that influences so. We're, you know, we're this group, we're all part of that client experience. And so I know that's been a driver um, for a lot of firms that have said, you know, we need to, you know, have our teams be, be thinking a little bit more um, collaboratively and, and with a client centric, you know, mindset, mindset. Are you seeing more firms recharge for credit card fees charged on client payments? More firms recharge for Oh, good question. Um, I'm not seeing, <clears throat> I don't think I'm seeing much of that, but Chris, maybe, I don't know if you have a, a bigger perspective of speaking with, with leadership, but I haven't seen much of it. I do, we'll get that question. I feel like once a year from someone <laughs> um, and the answer is always, it's a very small amount of firms who, who we're talking to about it. Um, so I'm not hearing much, much in this area. No, me neither. We'll follow up though, and if 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 whoever asked that question, you know, wants to to reach out, um, we'll do a little digging. We did ask um, some if if that person um, was a participant. We did ask in the survey this year about overhead on certain costs, and so we will have some slides um, in our survey um, rollout that show what the overhead costs are and some of the the changes around that um, that we didn't cover in the webinar today, but is in our survey data. So be on the lookout for, for that piece. 